Chapter Forty One. Dora's aunts. At last an answer came from the two old ladies. They presented their compliments to Mr. Copperfield, and informed him that they had given his letter their best consideration, with a view to the happiness of both parties, which I thought rather an alarming expression, not only because of the use they made of it in relation to the family difference before mentioned, but because I had, and have all my life, observed that conventional phrases are a sort of fireworks, easily let off and liable to take a great variety of shapes and colours, not at all suggested by their original form. The Mrs. Spenlows added that they begged to forbear expressing, through the medium of correspondence, an opinion on the subject of Mr. Copperfield's communication, but that if Mr. Copperfield would do them the favour to call upon a certain day, accompanied if he thought proper by a confidential friend, they would be happy to hold some conversation on the subject. To this favour Mr. Copperfield immediately replied, with his respectful compliments, that he would have the honour of waiting on the Mrs. Spenlow at the time appointed, accompanied in accordance with their kind permission by his friend Mr. Thomas Traddles of the Inner Temple. Having dispatched which missive, Mr. Copperfield fell into a condition of strong nervous agitation, and so remained until the day arrived. It was a great augmentation of my uneasiness to be bereaved at this eventful crisis of the inestimable services of Miss Mills, but Mr. Mills, who was always doing something or other to annoy me, or I felt as if he were, which was the same thing, had brought his conduct to a climax by taking it into his head that he would go to India. Why should he go to India except to harass me? To be sure, he had nothing to do with any other part of the world, and had a good deal to do with that part, being entirely in the India trade. Whatever that was, I had floating dreams myself concerning golden shawls and elephants' teeth, having been at Calcutta in his youth, and designing now to go there again in the capacity of resident partner. But this was nothing to me. However, it was so much to him that for India he was bound, and Julia with him, and Julia went into the country to take leave of her relations, and the house was put into a perfect suit of bills, announcing that it was to be let or sold, and that the furniture, mangle and all, was to be taken at a valuation. So here was another earthquake, of which I became the sport, before I had recovered from the shock of its predecessor. I was in several minds how to dress myself on the important day, being divided between my desire to appear to advantage, and my apprehensions of putting on anything that might impair my severely practical character in the eyes of the Mrs. Spenlow. I endeavoured to hit a happy medium between these two extremes. My aunt approved the result, and Mr. Dick threw one of his shoes after Traddles and me for luck as we went downstairs. Excellent fellow as I knew Traddles to be, and warmly attached to him as I was, I could not help wishing, on that delicate occasion, that he had never contracted the habit of brushing his hair so very upright. It gave him a surprised look, not to say a hearth-broomy kind of expression, which, my apprehensions whispered, might be fatal to us. I took the liberty of mentioning it to Traddles as we were walking to Putney, and saying that if he would smooth it down a little— "'My dear Copperfield,' said Traddles, lifting off his hat and rubbing his hair all kinds of ways. N "'Nothing would give me greater pleasure. But it won't.' "'Won't be smoothed down?' said I. "'No,' said Traddles. "'Nothing will induce it. If I was to carry a hundred weight upon it all the way to Putney, it would be up again the moment the weight was taken off. You have no idea what obstinate hair mine is, Copperfield. I am quite a fretful porcupine.' I was a little disappointed, I must confess, but thoroughly charmed by his good nature too. I told him how I esteemed his good nature, and said that his hair must have taken all the obstinacy out of his character, for he had none. Oh, returned Traddles, laughing, I assure you, it's quite an old story, my unfortunate hair. My uncle's wife couldn't bear it. She said it exasperated her. It stood very much in my way too when I first fell in love with Sophie, very much. Did she object to it? She didn't, rejoined Traddles, but her eldest sister, the one that's the beauty, quite made game of it, I understand. In fact, all the sisters laugh at it. Agreeable, said I. Yes, returned Traddles, with perfect innocence. It's a joke for us. They pretend that Sophie has a lock of it in her desk, and she is obliged to shut it in a clasped book to keep it down. We laugh about it. "'By the by, my dear Traddles,' said I, "'your experience may suggest something to me. "'When you became engaged to the young lady whom you have just mentioned, "'did you make a regular proposal to her family? "'Was there anything like, 
what we are going through today, for instance, I added nervously. Why, replied Traddles, on whose attentive face a thoughtful shade had stolen, it was rather a painful transaction, Copperfield, in my case. You see, Sophie being of so much use in the family, none of them could endure the thought of her ever being married. Indeed, they had quite settled among themselves that she was never to be married, and they called her the old maid. Accordingly, when I mentioned it, with the greatest precaution to Mrs. Crewler, "'The mamma," said I. "'The mamma," said Traddles. "'Reverend Horace Crewler. When I mentioned it with every possible precaution to Mrs. Crewler, the effect upon her was such that she gave a scream and became insensible. I couldn't approach the subject again for months. "'You did at last,' said I. "'Well, the Reverend Horace did,' said Traddles. "'He's an excellent man, most exemplary in every way. And he pointed out to her that she ought, as a Christian, to reconcile herself to the sacrifice, especially as it was so uncertain, and to bear no uncharitable feeling towards me.' as to myself copperfield i give you my word i felt a perfect bird of prey towards the family the sisters took your part i hope traddles why i can't say they did he returned when we had comparatively reconciled mrs crewler to it we had to break it to sarah you recollect my mentioning sarah as the one that has something the matter with her spine perfectly she clenched both her hands said traddles looking at me in dismay shut her eyes turned lead colour became perfectly stiff and took nothing for two days but toast and water administered with a teaspoon what a very unpleasant girl traddles i remarked oh i beg your pardon copperfield said traddles she's a very charming girl but she has a great deal of feeling in fact they all have sophie told me afterwards that the self-reproach she underwent while she was in attendance upon sarah no words could describe i know it must have been severe by my own feelings copperfield which were like a criminal's after sarah was restored we still had to break it to the other eight and it produced various effects upon them of a most pathetic nature the two little ones whom sophie educates have only just left off detesting me at any rate they are all reconciled to it now i hope said i yes i should say they were on the whole resigned to it said traddles doubtfully the fact is we avoid mentioning the subject and my unsettled prospects and indifferent circumstances are a great consolation to them there will be a deplorable scene whenever we are married it will be much more like a funeral than a wedding and they'll all hate me for taking her away his honest face as he looked at me with a serio-comic shake of his head impresses me more in the remembrance than it did in the reality for i was by this time in a state of such excessive trepidation and wandering of mind as to be quite unable to fix my attention on anything on our approaching the house where the mrs spenlow lived i was at such a discount in respect of my personal looks and presence of mind that traddles proposed a gentle stimulant in the form of a glass of ale this having been administered at a neighbouring public-house he conducted me with tottering steps to the mrs spenlow's door i had a vague sensation of being as it were on view when the maid opened it and of wavering somehow across a hall with a weather-glass in it into a quiet little drawing-room on the ground floor commanding a neat garden also of sitting down here on a sofa and seeing traddles hair start up now that his hat was removed like one of those obtrusive little figures made of springs that fly out of fictitious snuff-boxes when the lid is taken off also of hearing an old-fashioned clock ticking away on the chimney-piece and trying to make it keep time to the jerking of my heart which it wouldn't also of looking round the room for any sign of dora and seeing none also of thinking that jip once barked in the distance and was instantly choked by somebody ultimately i found myself backing traddles into the fireplace and bowing in great confusion to two dry little elderly ladies dressed in black and each looking wonderfully like a preparation in chip or tan of the late mr spenlow pray said one of the two little ladies be seated when i had done tumbling over traddles and had sat upon something which was not a cat my first seat was i so far recovered my sight as to perceive that mr spenlow had evidently been the youngest of the family that there was a disparity of six or eight years between the two sisters and that the younger appeared to be the manager of the conference inasmuch as she had my letter in her hand so familiar as it looked to me and yet so odd and was referring to it through an eyeglass they were dressed alike but this sister wore her dress with a more youthful air than the other and perhaps had a trifle more frill or tucker or brooch or bracelet or some little thing of that kind which made her look more lively they were both upright in their carriage formal precise composed and quiet 
The sister, who had not my letter, had her arms crossed on her breast and resting on each other like an idol. "'Mr. Copperfield, I believe,' said the sister who had got my letter, addressing herself to Traddles. This was a frightful beginning. Traddles had to indicate that I was Mr. Copperfield, and I had to lay claim to myself, and they had to divest themselves of a preconceived opinion that Traddles was Mr. Copperfield, and altogether we were in a nice condition. To improve it, we all distinctly heard Jip give two short barks, and receive another choke. "'Mr. Copperfield,' said the sister with the letter. I did something, bowed, I suppose, and was all attention, when the other sister struck in. "'My sister Lavinia,' she said, "'being conversant in matters of this nature, "'will state what we consider most calculated "'to promote the happiness of both parties.' "'I discovered afterwards that Miss Lavinia "'was an authority in affairs of the heart "'by reason of there having anciently existed "'a certain Mr. Pidger, who played short whist "'and was supposed to have been enamoured of her. "'My private opinion is that this was entirely a gratuitous assumption, "'and that Pidger was altogether innocent of any such sentiments, "'to which he had never given any sort of expression that I could ever hear of. "'Both Miss Lavinia and Miss Clarissa had a superstition, however, "'that he would have declared his passion if he had not been cut short in his youth, "'at about sixty, by over-drinking his constitution, "'and overdoing an attempt to set it right again by swilling bath-water.' they had a lurking suspicion even that he died of secret love though i must say there was a picture of him in the house with a damask nose which concealment did not appear to have ever preyed upon we will not said miss lavinia enter on the past history of this matter our poor brother francis's death has cancelled that we had not said miss clarissa been in the habit of frequent association with our brother francis but there was no decided division or disunion between us francis took his road we took ours we considered it conducive to the happiness of all parties that it should be so and it was so each of the sisters leaned a little forward to speak shook her head after speaking and became upright again when silent miss clarissa never moved her arms she sometimes played tunes upon them with her fingers minuets and marches i should think but never moved them our niece's position or supposed position is much changed by our brother francis's death said miss lavinia and therefore we consider our brother's opinions as regarded her position as being changed too we have no reason to doubt mr copperfield that you are a young gentleman possessed of good qualities and honourable character or that you have an affection or are fully persuaded that you have an affection for our niece I replied, as I usually did whenever I had a chance, that nobody had ever loved anybody else as I loved Dora. Traddles came to my assistance with a confirmatory murmur. Miss Lavinia was going on to make some rejoinder when Miss Clarissa, who appeared to be incessantly beset by a desire to refer to her brother Francis, struck in again. If Dora's mamma, she said, when she married our brother Francis, had at once said that there was not room for the family at the dinner-table, it would have been better for the happiness of all parties. "'Sister Clarissa,' said Miss Lavinia, "'perhaps we needn't mind that now.' "'Sister Lavinia,' said Miss Clarissa, "'it belongs to the subject. With your branch of the subject on which you alone are competent to speak, I should not think of interfering. On this branch of the subject I have a voice and an opinion.' It would have been much better for the happiness of all parties if Dora's mamma, when she married our brother Francis, had mentioned plainly what her intentions were. We should have known then what we had to expect. We should have said, pray, do not invite us at any time, and all possibility of misunderstanding would have been avoided. When Miss Clarissa had shaken her head, Miss Lavinia resumed, again referring to my letter through her eyeglass. They both had little bright round twinkling eyes, by the way, which were like birds' eyes. They were not unlike birds altogether, having a sharp, brisk, sudden manner, and a little short, spruce way of adjusting themselves like canaries. Miss Lavinia, as I have said, resumed. You ask permission of my sister Clarissa and myself, Mr. Copperfield, to visit here as the accepted suitor of our niece. "'If our brother Francis,' said Miss Clarissa, breaking out again, "'if I may call anything so calm a breaking out, "'wished to surround himself with an atmosphere of doctor's commons, "'and of doctor's commons only. "'What right or desire had we to object? "'None, I am sure. "'We have ever been far from wishing to obtrude ourselves on any one. "'But why not say so? "'Let our brother Francis and his wife have their society. "'Let my sister Lavinia and myself have our society. "'We can find it for ourselves, I hope.' As this appeared to be addressed to Traddles and me, both Traddles and I made some sort of reply. Traddles was inaudible. I think I observed, myself, that it was highly creditable to all concerned. 
I don't in the least know what I meant.' "'Sister Lavinia,' said Miss Clarissa, having now relieved her mind, "'you can go on, my dear.' Miss Lavinia proceeded. "'Mr. Copperfield, my sister Clarissa and I have been very careful indeed in considering this letter, and we have not considered it without finally showing it to our niece and discussing it with our niece. We have no doubt that you think you like her very much.' "'Think, ma'am,' I rapturously began. "'Oh!' But Miss Clarissa, giving me a look, just like a sharp canary, as requesting that I would not interrupt the oracle, I begged pardon. "'Affection,' said Miss Lavinia, glancing at her sister for corroboration, which she gave in the form of a little nod to every clause, "'mature affection, homage, devotion, does not easily express itself. Its voice is low, it is modest and retiring, it lies in ambush, waits and waits. Such is the mature fruit. Sometimes a life glides away and finds it is still ripening in the shade.' of course i did not understand then that this was an allusion to her supposed experience of the stricken pidger but i saw from the gravity with which miss clarissa nodded her head that great weight was attached to these words the light for i call them in comparison with such sentiments the light inclinations of very young people pursued miss lavinia are dust compared to rocks it is owing to the difficulty of knowing whether they are likely to endure or have any real foundation that my sister clarissa and myself have been very undecided how to act mr copperfield and mr traddles said my friend finding himself looked at i beg pardon of the inner temple i believe said miss clarissa again glancing at my letter traddles said exactly so and became pretty red in the face now, although I had not received any express encouragement as yet, I fancy that I saw in the two little sisters, and particularly in Miss Lavinia, an intensified enjoyment of this new and fruitful subject of domestic interest, a settling down to make the most of it, a disposition to pet it, in which there was a good bright ray of hope. I thought I perceived that Miss Lavinia would have uncommon satisfaction in superintending two young lovers, like Dora and me, and that Miss Clarissa would have hardly any less satisfaction in seeing her superintend us, and in chiming in with her own particular department of the subject, whenever that impulse was strong upon her. This gave me courage to protest most vehemently that I loved Dora better than I could tell, or any one believe that all my friends knew how i loved her that my aunt agnes traddles every one who knew me knew how i loved her and how earnest my love had made me for the truth of this i appealed to traddles and traddles firing up as if he were plunging into a parliamentary debate really did come out nobly confirming me in good round terms and in a plain sensible practical manner that evidently made a favourable impression "'I speak, if I may presume to say so, as one who has some little experience of such things,' said Traddles, "'being myself engaged to a young lady, one of ten, down in Devonshire, and seeing no probability at present of our engagement coming to a termination.' "'You may be able to confirm what I have said, Mr. Traddles,' observed Miss Lavinia, evidently taking a new interest in him, "'of the affection that is modest and retiring, that waits and waits.' entirely madam said traddles miss clarissa looked at miss lavinia and shook her head gravely miss lavinia looked consciously at miss clarissa and heaved a little sigh sister lavinia said miss clarissa take my smelling bottle miss lavinia revived herself with a few whiffs of aromatic vinegar traddles and i looking on with great solicitude the while and then went on to say rather faintly my sister and myself have been in great doubt, Mr. Traddles, what course we ought to take in reference to the likings, or imaginary likings, of such very young people as your friend Mr. Copperfield and our niece. Our brother Francis's child, remarked Clarissa, if our brother Francis's wife had found it convenient in her lifetime, though she had an unquestionable right to act as she thought best, to invite the family to her dinner-table, we might have known our brother Francis's child better at the present moment. Sister Lavinia, proceed. Miss Lavinia turned my letter so as to bring the superscription towards herself, and referred through her eyeglass to some orderly-looking note she had made on that part of it. It seems to us— said she, prudent, Mr. Traddles, to bring these feelings to the test of our own observation. At present we know nothing of them. We are not in a situation to judge how much reality there may be in them. Therefore we are inclined so far to accede to Mr. Copperfield's proposal as to admit his visits here. "'I shall never, dear ladies,' I exclaimed, relieved of an immense load of apprehension, "'forget your kindness.' "'But,' pursued Miss Lavinia, "'but 
we would prefer to regard those visits mr traddles as made at present to us we must guard ourselves from recognising any positive engagement between mr copperfield and our niece until we have had an opportunity until you have had an opportunity sister lavinia said miss clarissa be it so said miss lavinia with a sigh until i have had an opportunity of observing them copperfield said traddles turning to me you feel i am sure that nothing could be more reasonable or considerate nothing cried i i am deeply sensible of it in this position of affairs said miss lavinia again referring to her notes and admitting his visits on this understanding only we must require from mr copperfield a distinct assurance on his word of honour that no communication of any kind shall take place between him and our niece without our knowledge that no project whatever shall be entertained with regard to our niece without first being submitted to us to you sister lavinia miss clarissa interposed be it so clarissa assented miss lavinia resignedly to me and receiving our concurrence we must make this a most express and serious stipulation not to be broken on any account we wished mr copperfield to be accompanied by some confidential friend to-day with an inclination of our head towards traddles who bowed in order that there might be no doubt or misconception on this subject if mr copperfield or if you mr traddles feel the least scruple in giving this promise i beg you to take time to consider it i exclaimed in a state of high ecstatic fervour that not a moment's consideration would be necessary i bound myself to the required promise in a most impassioned manner called upon traddles to witness it and denounced myself as the most atrocious of characters if i ever swerved from it in the least degree stay said miss lavinia holding up her hand we resolved before we had the pleasure of receiving you two gentlemen to leave you alone for a quarter of an hour to consider this point you will allow us to retire it was in vain for me to say that no consideration was necessary they persisted in withdrawing for the specified time accordingly these little birds hopped out with great dignity leaving me to receive the congratulations of traddles and to feel as if i were translated to regions of exquisite happiness exactly at the expiration of the quarter of an hour they reappeared with no less dignity than they had disappeared they had gone rustling away as if their little dresses were made of autumn leaves and they came rustling back in a like manner i then bound myself once more to the prescribed conditions sister clarissa said miss lavinia the rest is with you miss clarissa unfolding her arms for the first time took the notes and glanced at them we shall be happy said miss clarissa to see mr copperfield to dinner every sunday if it should suit his convenience our hour is three i bowed in the course of the week said miss clarissa we shall be happy to see mr copperfield to tea our hour is half past six i bowed again twice in the week said miss clarissa but as a rule not oftener i bowed again miss trotwood said miss clarissa mentioned in mr copperfield's letter will perhaps call upon us when visiting is better for the happiness of all parties we are glad to receive visits and return them when it is better for the happiness of all parties that no visiting should take place as in the case of our brother francis and his establishment that is quite different i intimated that my aunt would be proud and delighted to make their acquaintance though i must say i was not quite so sure of their getting on very satisfactorily together the conditions being now closed i expressed my acknowledgments in the warmest manner and taking the hand first of miss clarissa and then of miss lavinia pressed it in each case to my lips miss lavinia then arose and begging mr traddles to excuse us for a minute requested me to follow her i obeyed all in a tremble and was conducted to another room there i found my blessed darling stopping her ears behind the door with her dear little face against the wall and jip in the plate-warmer with his head tied up in a towel oh how beautiful she was in her black frock and how she sobbed and cried at first and wouldn't come out from behind the door how fond we were of one another when she did come out at last and what a state of bliss i was in when we took jip out of the plate-warmer and restored him to the light sneezing very much and were all three reunited my dearest dora now indeed my own for ever oh don't pleaded dora please are you not my own for ever dora oh yes of course i am cried dora but i am so frightened frightened my own oh yes i don't like him said dora why don't he go who my life your friend said dora 
It isn't any business of his. What a stupid he must be. My love, there never was anything so coaxing as her childish ways. He is the best creature. Oh, but we don't want any best creatures, pouted Dora. My dear, I argued, you will soon know him well, and like him of all things. And there is my aunt coming soon, and you like her of all things, too, when you know her. No, please don't bring her, said Dora, giving me a horrified little kiss and folding her hands. Don't. I know she's a naughty, mischief-making old thing. Don't let her come here, Doady, which was a corruption of David. Remonstrance was of no use then, so I laughed and admired her, and was very much in love and very happy. And she showed me Jip's new trick of standing on his hind legs in a corner, which he did for about the space of a flash of lightning, and then fell down. And I don't know how long I should have stayed there, oblivious of Traddles, if Miss Lavinia had not come in to take me away. Miss Lavinia was very fond of Dora. She told me Dora was exactly like what she had been herself at her age. She must have altered a good deal. And she treated Dora just as if she had been a toy. I wanted to persuade Dora to come and see Traddles, but on my proposing it she ran off to her own room and locked herself in. So I went to Traddles without her and walked away with him on air. "'Nothing could be more satisfactory,' said Traddles. "'And they are very agreeable old ladies, I am sure. "'I shouldn't be at all surprised if you were to be married years before me, Copperfield.' "'Does your Sophie play any instrument, Traddles?' I inquired in the pride of my heart. "'She knows enough of the piano to teach it to her little sisters,' said Traddles. "'Does she sing at all?' I asked. "'Why, she sings ballads sometimes, to freshen up the others a little when they are out of spirits,' said Traddles. "'Nothing scientific.' "'She doesn't sing to the guitar,' said I. "'Oh, dear, no,' said Traddles. "'Paint at all?' "'Not at all,' said Traddles. "'I promised Traddles that he should hear Dora sing "'and see some of her flower painting. "'He said he should like it very much, "'and we went home arm in arm in great good humour and delight. "'I encouraged him to talk about Sophie on the way, "'which he did with a loving reliance on her "'that I very much admired.' I compared her in my mind with Dora with considerable inward satisfaction, but I candidly admitted to myself that she seemed to be an excellent kind of girl for Traddles, too. Of course, my aunt was immediately made acquainted with the successful issue of the conference, and with all that had been said and done in the course of it. She was happy to see me so happy, and promised to call on Dora's aunts without loss of time. But she took such a long walk up and down our rooms that night, while I was writing to Agnes, that I began to think she meant to walk till morning. My letter to Agnes was a fervent and grateful one, narrating all the good effects that had resulted from my following her advice. She wrote by return of post to me. Her letter was hopeful and earnest and cheerful. She was always cheerful from that time. I had my hands more full than ever now. My daily journeys to Highgate considered, Putney was a long way off, and I naturally wanted to go there as often as I could. The proposed tea-drinkings being quite impracticable, I compounded with Miss Lavinia for permission to visit every Saturday afternoon, without detriment to my privileged Sundays. So the close of every week was a delicious time for me, and I got through the rest of the week by looking forward to it. I was wonderfully relieved to find that my aunt and Dora's aunts rubbed on, all things considered, much more smoothly than I could have expected. My aunt made her promised visit within a few days of the conference, and within a few more days Dora's aunts called upon her, in due state and form. Similar but more friendly exchanges took place afterwards, usually at intervals of three or four weeks. I know that my aunt distressed Dora's aunts very much, by utterly setting at naught the dignity of fly-conveyance, and walking out to Putney at extraordinary times, as shortly after breakfast or just before tea, likewise by wearing her bonnet in any manner that happened to be comfortable to her head, without at all deferring to the prejudices of civilization on that subject. But Dora's aunts soon agreed to regard my aunt as an eccentric and somewhat masculine lady, with a strong understanding, and although my aunt occasionally ruffled the feathers of Dora's aunts by expressing heretical opinions on various points of ceremony, she loved me too well not to sacrifice some of her little peculiarities to the general harmony. The only member of our small society who positively refused to adapt himself to circumstances was Jip. He never saw my aunt without immediately displaying every tooth in his head, retiring under a chair and growling incessantly with now and then a doleful howl, as if she really were too much for his feelings. All kinds of treatment were tried with him, 
coaxing scolding slapping bringing him to buckingham street where he instantly dashed at the two cats to the terror of all beholders but he never could prevail upon himself to bear my aunt's society he would sometimes think he had got the better of his objection and be amiable for a few minutes and then would put up his snub nose and howl to that extent that there was nothing for it but to blind him and put him in the plate warmer at length dora regularly muffled him up in a towel and shut him up there whenever my aunt was reported at the door one thing troubled me much after we had fallen into this quiet train it was that dora seemed by one consent to be regarded like a pretty toy or plaything my aunt with whom she gradually became familiar always called her little blossom and the pleasure of miss lavinia's life was to wait upon her curl her hair make ornaments for her and treat her like a pet child what miss lavinia did her sister did as a matter of course it was very odd to me but they all seemed to treat dora in her degree much as dora treated jip in his i made up my mind to speak to dora about this and one day when we were out walking for we were licensed by miss lavinia after a while to go out walking by ourselves i said to her that i wish she could get them to behave towards her differently because you know my darling i remonstrated you are not a child there said dora now you are going to be cross cross my love i am sure they are very kind to me said dora and i am very happy well but my dearest life said i you might be very happy and yet be treated rationally dora gave me a reproachful look the prettiest look and then began to sob saying if i didn't like her why had i ever wanted so much to be engaged to her and why didn't i go away now if i couldn't bear her what could i do but kiss her tears away and tell her how i doted on her after that i am sure i am very affectionate said dora but you oughtn't to be cruel to me doady cruel my precious love as if i would or could be cruel to you for the world then don't find fault with me said dora making a rosebud of her mouth and i'll be good i was charmed with her presently asking me of her own accord to give her that cookery book i had once spoken of and to show her how to keep accounts as i had once promised i would i brought the volume with me on my next visit i got it prettily bound first to make it look less dry and more inviting and as we strolled about the common i showed her an old housekeeping book of my aunt's and gave her a set of tablets and a pretty little pencil case and box of leads to practise housekeeping with but the cookery book made dora's head ache and the figures made her cry they wouldn't add up she said so she rubbed them out and drew little nosegays and likenesses of me and jip all over the tablets then i playfully tried verbal instruction on domestic matters as we walked about on a saturday afternoon sometimes for example when we passed a butcher shop i would say now suppose my pet that we were married and you were going to buy a shoulder of mutton for dinner would you know how to buy it my pretty little dora's face would fall and she would make her mouth into a bud again as if she would very much prefer to shut mine with a kiss would you know how to buy it my darling i would repeat perhaps if i were very inflexible dora would think a little and then reply perhaps with great triumph why the butcher would know how to sell it and what need i know oh you silly boy so when i once asked dora with an eye to the cookery book what she would do if we were married and i were to say i would like a nice irish stew she replied that she would tell the servant to make it and then clapped her little hands together across my arm and laughed in such a charming manner that she was more delightful than ever consequently the principal use to which the cookery book was devoted was being put down in the corner for jip to stand upon and dora was so pleased when she had trained him to stand upon it without offering to come off and at the same time to hold the pencil case in his mouth that i was very glad i had bought it we fell back on the guitar case and the flower painting and the songs about never leaving off dancing tarala and were as happy as the week was long i occasionally wished i could venture to hint to miss lavinia that she treated the darling of my heart a little too much like a plaything and i sometimes awoke as it were wondering to find that i had fallen into the general fault and treated her like a plaything too but not often End of chapter forty 